So, okay, I'm guessing you're pretty used to this channel by now. We've talked about a lot of movies, we've talked about a lot of shows, but does anyone remember that one time I did a gaming review? Yeah, the Evil Dead Fistful of Boomstick one. And remember how I kept saying I wanted to do more of those? Yeah, I don't know what happened to that. But it's time to fix it. Welcome to my top 5 JRPGs! So why JRPGs? Well, it's strange. I tend to get distracted from games, not out of boredom, but because, well, there's just so much stuff out there for me to enjoy, and I kinda wanna get to it all. But those old school JRPGs? Despite being the longest, often most convoluted games, they always grab me. I always end up taking the most time with them, insisting on seeing everything they have to offer. And they tend to be the games I replay the most, even if there's no true replay value. I just enjoy the settings and the classic style so much. It really is a genre I adore, but with that said, I haven't actually played that many. I kind of grew up in a small town with no easy access to buying video games, so a lot of the ones that people would mention kind of slipped by me as a kid. I mean, why do you think this is a top 5 rather than a top 10? But I still really want to talk about some games I especially adore, and I figured I'd call in some help. John, you're up! Hey, I'm John Bender Waffles Algets. I teach game development over on my channel with a focus on JRPGs, though we will be shifting into other genres in the future. Now, I absolutely love this genre, though truth be told, it isn't exactly my favorite. But I've certainly played enough and analyzed enough of them to be able to help out with this video. So how about we, you know, jump right into it. You got it, Futurama Breakfast. Ready out there, folks? These are my top five favorite JRPGs. Okay, let me just say, I gave up on understanding the Shin Megami Tensei franchise a long ass time ago. Just, just looking at the list of games and spin-off series, I have no idea what's what, and not a lot of them have ever been released here in the first place. So I've only really played like half of Devil Survivor. Or Lucifer's Call? Are those the same game? Is it a main series game or a spin-off? Is it a devil surviving or am I surviving a devil? Who's Lucifer calling? Is it Collect? See how confused I am? Well, that is to say, I played that, and Persona 4. In Persona 4, you play a high school student moving to a smaller town to live with your uncle for a year while your parents are away. But as you go about life attending school and meeting new friends, strange deaths start happening. Deaths all involving a mysterious TV channel that only seems to play at midnight. As you investigate further though, it turns out a whole lot more than that is going on. Persona 4 has a lot going for it, from a strong story to an unusual urban setting to the series trademark demon recruiting and summoning mechanic. But what really catches my attention about Persona 4 is how character driven the game is. The game is certainly built around its characters, and not just in regards to its story like a lot of other JRPGs. It encourages you to go out of your way to talk to pretty much everybody, sort of like Mass Effect. Where Persona differs from Mass Effect, however, is that the relationships have a direct effect on the Personas themselves, which impacts gameplay rather than who does or says what. To give you a little more detail, the Personas you can summon are divided into groups based on symbols from tarot cards like Tower, Fool, Magician, and so on. But these are also represented by your characters and various NPCs, meaning that the more you interact with them outside of the main quest, the more you can power up whole groups of monsters you can summon. From a design perspective, this is absolutely ingenious, as it not only encourages players to explore your world in a more in-depth way, but also introduces an element of player choice, allowing them to craft their gameplay experience however they see fit once they get a hang of how the system works. See, in this game, you're living out the full year you're spending in this little town day by day. When you're not fighting monsters and exploring dungeons, you're going to school, holding a part-time job, attending free time activities, and interacting with friends, family, and acquaintances. You have to map out your time and choose when to interact with who and how you do it, and then live with the gameplay that follows it. And unless you're following a guide to the letter, you will lock some of these paths or not develop someone fully the first time around, potentially making each playthrough markedly different from the last. So it's a good thing the characters are quite varied and interesting. If you enjoy slice of life high school anime, that is. I think this is the perfect way to describe the overall feel of the game. It draws pretty heavily on manga and anime tropes. On the surface, the anime-inspired world feels innocent and sweet, but underneath there's a layer of darkness. This does two things. 
It gives the players something to fight against and also helps them connect with the world so they have something to fight for. And fight you will. This game is balls hard at times, both in terms of gameplay and player punches. Depending on which characters you develop and grow to love, certain story beats will absolutely wreck you just by adding or taking away little things from your daily routine. It's really pretty impressive. All in all, Persona 4 is considered a bit of a modern classic for a reason, and it's one of the most personally engaging gaming experiences I've had. Okay, you've seen me do two videos about it, so it's no secret. I love Dragon Ball, and I've been a huge fan of Akira Toriyama since they started releasing the manga here when I was like, 11 or so. So any game with his art style is gonna attract my attention. But Chrono Trigger is way more than just a standard RPG with an Akira Toriyama coat of paint. I'm looking at you, Blue Dragon. For starters, this game was developed by a JRPG dream team of sorts. Hironobu Sakaguchi, the creator of Final Fantasy, teamed up with Dragon Quest designer Yuji Horii to create a game much different than either of their previous works. They set out to tell a story revolving around something not commonly seen within RPGs, time travel. When a boy named Chrono and his friends accidentally discover time travel, as you do, they learn that in the future the world will be utterly laid to waste by a powerful being known only as Lavos. What follows is a journey through many different time periods in an attempt to either defeat Lavos or prevent it from appearing in the first place. And when I say either or, I mean it. This game can go a lot of ways. Yeah, this game has an insane amount of possible endings. There's something like 14 different unique endings and each one of them has variations depending on choices that you made throughout the game. It's completely mind boggling. It's fitting for a game about time travel and really impressive at the time. And it goes further than that. Almost every period you visit has an accompanying playable character for your party, keeping the main cast very lively, colorful, and varied, containing robots, cave people, and a... Uh, buff Kermit. Who is awesome! These differences play into the actual gameplay mechanics themselves. The battle system uses a sort of combo attack system called double and triple attacks, where different characters combine their different attack styles and abilities to hit targets for massive damage. All of this wrapped up in an active battle time system that feels familiar enough to JRPG fans while also providing enough uniqueness to make it fresh. It's also kind of a middle ground between traditional turn-based battle systems and more action-oriented systems like those seen in the Legend of Zelda series. Enemies wander the overworld visibly and you can choose to attack or run away as need be. However, once you do engage them, it switches to a separate battle instance. It kind of reminds me a bit of Secret of Mana in places. God, can we just get some more couch co-op JRPGs like that? Please? Somebody? Please? Yeah, I wouldn't hold your breath on that one, as the co-op system for that... sucked. Anyway, this character variety allows Toriyama's imagination to run wild, and it shows in the designs of absolutely everything from random people to monsters to settings. There's just always something super awesome to look at. In short, Chrono Trigger combines all the best elements of a multitude of genres to provide an awesome experience. And to think, all that happened because Luca invented a teleporter. Good thing she's not Jeff Goldblum. So now that we're at the third entry, I think it's time to introduce a Final Fantasy GAME! Okay, look, before you run a Buster Saw through my chest, I love Final Fantasy, I do! But I didn't have that many of the games as a kid, and there are many I haven't actually played to the end. So that's at least partly why the franchise doesn't rank higher for me. But anyway, number three on my list is that all-time PS1 classic that everyone and their mother will always mention if you say Final Fantasy. The game that is truly made of all the material that made people love the franchise. I am of course talking about Final Fantasy IX. Oh, no! Oh, no! Okay, so I guess I'll introduce this game since Ash is currently being trampled by a horde of chocobo. Ooh, a gold one! Oh god, they're petting my eyes! Right, so which game are we doing? Really? I would have thought seven. That's my ear, that's my ear! Okay, so Final Fantasy IX. The final game in the series on the original PlayStation follows Zidane and his companions as they do battle with Kuja the massively effeminate monkey man with a chip on his shoulder and a desire to, what else, but destroy the whole goddamn world. Right, and Primer is about a couple dudes building a toaster in the garage. Given that this is a Final Fantasy game, there's a lot more than that going on. 
While 9 doesn't necessarily offer much new in terms of gameplay, it thrives on its great and at times surprisingly dark story, dealing with such things as the inevitability of death, purpose of life and importance of experience. It comes off especially dark for a game with such a cute and light-hearted art style. But then, I always like my fantasy more colorful and idealistic than the darker, more serious stuff you see in Final Fantasy 6 to 8. And I think that is why this game sometimes gets hate from the more modern Final Fantasy fans. See, this game was developed at roughly the same time as the next two installments in the franchise, and was meant to represent the series' past, whereas 10 was meant to represent the present and 11 its future. This is why the game has so many references to previous games, such as the hood that Garnet wears at the beginning of the game looking like a white mage's hood. Or, you know, everything about Vivi. Who is a great character, by the way, as are the rest of them. With, um, a few exceptions. The whole game runs on embracing its classic fantasy roots. Each character fits squarely into old character classes and archetypes, there's plenty of magic and monsters, and of course, it's got a deeply entertaining and super theatrical villain and his two balls. No, nah, no, not those two. These. Good. God, it's like he's trying to out-nut David Bowie in Labyrinth. Jump, magic, jump, magic, jump, jump magic, jump, 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 magic, jump, jump, magic, jump, jump, Kuja is probably one of the most memorable parts of the game, and a lot of that has to do with his design. Drawing a lot of cues from previous villains in the series, Kuja is most reminiscent of Kefka from Six, in both his overall demeanor as well as his love of theatrics. Not to mention the fact that both are absolutely batshit insane. Also, a fun little aside, if you doubted his flamboyantness for some reason, just look at his name, Kuja, which is derived from the Japanese word for peacock. Oh, so that's why he wears that tiny thong. Sure, let's, let's go with that. I won't deny that picking this also has a lot to do with nostalgia though. It was one of the first JRPGs I played, and it was one of the first heavily story-driven English games that I played and beat all by myself, so for me it was definitely a milestone. That said though, Final Fantasy IX just oozes personality and has given me many great memories for life. You mean memories of life. Can it, Robo Pancake? Alright, we've already done this first part, so let me just, uh... Blah blah blah, Big Pen of Dragon Ball, blah blah blah, Akira Toriyama, blah blah blah. Okay, Dragon Quest. Talk about a franchise that gets overlooked in the West. For all the love Final Fantasy gets here, Dragon Quest did almost all of it first, and is considerably more popular in Japan than Final Fantasy ever was. Funny how that works. I've played quite a few of these games, and while my favorite would probably be 8 if we're speaking of them strictly as games, my best experience has been with Dragon Quest V The Hand of the Heavenly Bride. The DS remake, to be more exact and it all has to do with just how engaging it is. Actually, John, you can sit this one out. It's, it's all story stuff from here. But I, I have so much to say. Quiet, you bowing strudel. Wow, you are really stretching now, aren't you? Shut up. In Dragon Quest V, you begin as a child following your father on various adventures and eventually grow through the story into an adult legendary hero out to save the world from evil forces. Sounds like pretty standard fare, I know, but it does have some unique things going for it, like actually aging as the story goes on, giving you the ability to recruit monsters for your party, and starting a- Just like in Dragon Quest Monsters, the Game Boy Color game from 1998 that completely revolves around this mechanic. Thank you for the insight, John. But the thing about Dragon Quest V, though, is just how mean it is. For the bright and inviting world it takes place in, the hero goes through so much shit it's unbelievable, and it's no wonder he's a total sourpuss in all the official art. Every time you think you can relax, the story introduces some new gut punch, and it makes finally beating the villains extremely cathartic and rewarding. Add to that the wonderful party chat, where almost everybody has something new to say in every location, and you got yourself a seriously engaging story. There's a little anecdote I like to tell to explain just how engaging this game was for me. So sit back and... Oh, um, spoiler warning. A pretty big one, actually. At one point in the game, you have to get married and have the choice of three brides. The dutiful Nera, your childhood friend Bianca, and the haughty, narcissistic, boastful Debra that mostly treats you like dirt. I tend to go with Debra because I'm just a kinky ah. bastard like that. During your travels towards a kingdom, whoever you choose as your bride will eventually faint, revealing that she's pregnant, and will be taken into the castle to give birth, complete with making you wait in the hall for the children to be born. Actually, this game is credited as being the first game to feature playable pregnancy, and not just something that happens off-screen as part of the plot. Pretty neat, huh? Thank you, John! 
when I played this part, I had been playing obsessively for days. Any free moment I had, I was playing and grinding and exploring. But at this time in the game, I was playing it in a place where I couldn't turn on the volume, and I didn't have any headphones with me. It was... It was in class. Don't play video games in class. You disgust me. But once I was waiting in that hall, I froze. I couldn't get myself to go anywhere or skip any dialogue boxes. And eventually, I paused the game, put it away, paid attention for the rest of the class, and waited until I got home to play it further. Why? Because I didn't want to miss hearing the sound of my children crying when they were born. If that doesn't prove how engaging I found this game, I don't know what will. Outside of just being colorful and endearing, Dragon Quest V is one of the best stories I've been told in a game like this. And I will never forget how it felt to play it for the first time. And finally, number one is... Breath of Fire 3. Yeah, you think Dragon Quest is underappreciated? Here's a franchise that never got the recognition it deserved, despite consisting of four great games, all of which I've played and beaten. But isn't there a fifth game? Like I said, four games. But what about Dragon Court? Four great games. But there's also the Japanese Boy, mobile there game. Boy, there sure are four games in this series! The Breath of Fire franchise has each game center on Ryu, a blue-haired protagonist belonging to a race of people capable of turning into dragons. Or dragons that take human form, I'm not always quite sure. The story is different each time, but the main character, as well as his main love interest Nina, appear in them all with various small changes. Kinda like Link and Zelda, actually. In part 3, you awaken as a dragon whelp in a mineshaft, alone and confused before you manage to escape and are taken in by a couple of good-hearted thieves. When they accidentally piss off the wrong mob boss, however, they are kidnapped and you make it your life mission to save them. And end up on a world-saving adventure? Yeah, pretty much. I know I'm sounding like a broken record by now, but a huge part of the appeal is how colorful it is. Just look at it! It's so vibrant, so welcoming, so endearing, and the world is populated by loads and loads of speeches beyond just plain old humans. In fact, strictly speaking, none of the main characters are plain old humans. There's so much visual variety and imagination with these guys that it wows me every time. Although my favorite characters are actually from the fourth game. It definitely has a very classical feel. Despite being released on the original PlayStation, the game's graphical style is much more reminiscent of SNES JRPGs than its more dark and gritty counterparts of the era. Adding to this is the hand-drawn art style mixed in with three-dimensional environments, which looks absolutely fantastic and helps it hold up even to this day. One of the most fun parts of the game is the dragon mechanic. Rather than the other games where it basically functions like typical summons, here you have to find dragon genes around the overworld and can put them in combinations of three, altering the dragon's elements, main stat and overall form. Add stuff like battle positions, unique abilities for certain characters, and masters that can alter your stats and abilities as you level up, and you actually have a pretty in-depth battle system to play around in for a PS1 RPG. This is something that I absolutely love about JRPGs. No other type of game can be so varied and still considered part of the same genre. Within JRPGs, systems can be completely different from each other, and there's a freedom to experiment with new kinds of gameplay mechanics, such as this game's system and the dragon genes. Like with Final Fantasy IX, a lot of it definitely has to do with nostalgia though. A friend gave me this game because as he put it, he didn't understand it. See, I still have the copy he gave me. And while today I can recognize that the story is still somewhat standard and the translation is not very good, it did introduce me to a lot of tropes I wasn't familiar with at the time. Like that of a fallible god figure. Yeah, most of the quest centers on one character questioning the purpose of his creation by a creature that thinks itself a god, and puts into question whether or not this godlike figure's actions are justified or not. This was huge for me at the time, despite never being particularly religious. Thematically, a lot of JRPGs depict gods or religious figures as imperfect. This has a lot to do with the way that Japanese culture views religion, which is much more casual than Western societies. Breath of Fire 3 is a welcome friend to me at this point, and I keep coming back to play and beat it one more time just to hang out in this colorful, fun world of gods and dragons. I don't think it will ever stop being my favorite. So there you have it. Those are my top 5 favorite JRPGs. Now there are plenty more that I've played and even more that I've heard about and really want to try, so go ahead and tell me what some of your favorites are in the comments. 
I'm always looking to play more. And thanks to Bender Waffles for popping in. It was fun having you, John. Well, thanks for having me, Anecdote Obsession. You can go now. Okay. Hey there guys and thanks for watching this video. And thanks to John for joining me for it. Make sure to click here on the screen to check out his channel for tons of great tutorials. And if you want to see more of my mug, please like, comment and subscribe and consider supporting me on Patreon. More info about that is in the description. See you next time.